Thank you. I'm Philip Berry, the Chief Operating Officer at the High Museum of Art, and on behalf of our entire board and staff, I am delighted to welcome you to Rich Auditorium um, and welcome you to a premiere, the first look ever at the documentary John Portman, A Life of Building, that explores the life and work of John Portman, one of the world's most innovative architects. Tonight's screening will be followed by a panel discussion with a few of the people featured in the documentary, including Max Goggin, Mac, Mickey Steinberg, Mickey, and the film's award-winning director, Ben Lotterman. Ben? Also, there's Ben. Don't go too far, please. <laughs> um, also, after the program, um, there's a reception to which all of you are invited. It's in center space, which is just to the right as you exit the auditorium. You, you go right. If you go too far around the corner to Symphony Hall, you're going to bump into a celebration of Tupac Shakur's 40th birthday in the Atlanta Symphony Hall. <laughs> so it's a commemoration of his birthday, but if you've gone that far, you might want to reverse your tracks. So sit back and enjoy this extraordinary documentary on an extraordinary man, John Portman. Okay, I think we're ready to introduce uh, tonight's three distinguished panelists. And as I introduce them, I ask that they come up on stage. Uh, first of all, for more than 20 years, Ben Lotterman has been one of public television's most prolific producers of current affairs and historical documentaries. His work has appeared on PBS flagship current affairs series Frontline since 1982. He has also contributed programs to the PBS history flagship series, American Experience, and has won national Emmy, <clears throat> excuse me, national Emmy Awards for outstanding achievement in directing and investigative journalism and the recipient of Amnesty International's Media Spotlight Award, Ben Lotterman. <laughs> Goggin is, <clears throat> excuse me, a principal in the firm of Max Goggin, Merrill Alum Architects here in Atlanta. He is the Kojima Professor in Practice of Architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, where he was chairman of the Department of Architecture from 1990 to 1995. He has won numerous awards, and his work has been the subject of a 1992 Rizzoli publication, Skagen, Elam, and Bray, Critical Architecture, architectural criticism. Ladies and gentlemen, Max Goggin. <laughs> Mickey Steinberg is a longtime friend and advisor to John Portman. He served as executive vice president of the Portman companies from the 1960s through the 1980s, and later as executive vice president and chief operating officer of Walt Disney Imagineering and as chairman and chief executive officer of Sony Retail Entertainment. As senior advisor to the chairman of Portman Holdings, Mr. Steinberg provides counsel based on his extensive development and operational expertise in the commercial real estate industry. Ladies and gentlemen, Mickey Steinberg. I think the format will be, um, we have a couple of prearranged questions, and then we'll open them to the audience for a few additional questions. So, Ben, we'd like to start with you. First of all, congratulations on a great documentary. Thank you. I mean, and I, I should also say, Philip, thanks to the high. It looked beautiful. It looked better here than I've ever seen it or ever will see it. So thank you for a great projection. And uh, I just think it's a real tribute to the high. I mean, I got goosebumps because we were here a year ago, March, filming a conversation with Mickey and John. And I, you know, so you can't imagine what John Portman would be thinking, seeing this is your life. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, just to be able to have this kind of event tonight and a tribute to Tupac next door and other things going on is <laughs> pretty amazing. 
It's a wonderful town. <laughs> it's a wonderful town. So let's, let's pose the first question to you, Ben. Um, it's sort of a micro and a macro. So why don't you give us the 30,000 foot view concept of how you put the film together. And secondly, I don't think I've ever seen architecture so beautifully documented, uh, artistically, dynamically, um, organically. So tell us a little bit about the specific challenges and opportunities that Mr. Portman's um, architecture and his genius presented to you as a filmmaker. Okay, real quick. I don't do 30,000 feet. I'm just not that kind of filmmaker. I'm kind of an up-close kind of guy. And John Portman is not most comfortable when you're getting into his personal space. So that was an interesting dynamic. The opportunities came uh, most from his son, Michael. You see many of Michael's photographs in there, but um, one of John Portman's sons has taken on the mantle of really showcasing the work, which is scary as hell because I'm a documentary filmmaker. I go to Iran, you know, I'm doing frontline stuff. And um, Michael is taking pictures of what I would call, as a documentary filmmaker, a product shot. You know, something like this that you see in a commercial. Only it's the SunTrust building, right? <laughs> and it's like, get the light perfect, you know, and cue the clouds and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so the opportunities really came not just from using Michael's photography, but knowing that somebody had labored uh, over these buildings to figure out the best angle, the right time of day, the, you know, the sun kick and all that kind of stuff. The, the, the challenges are that I am a documentary filmmaker. I don't make product shots. You know, I don't, I don't do that. And I mean, Mickey, they're wonderful, but the, the Billy, they don't walk, they don't talk, they don't, they don't do anything, you know? They, they sit there, you know? So you gotta feel, well, Jesus, you know, at least you're gonna have to light them nicely. And I had a lot of good help from James Callanan, the cinematographer, and a couple guys who did some, I think, really special work with time lapse in a way that lets you do what Paul Goldberger said, which is experience the buildings through time a bit as well as space. Great, thank you. Okay, Mickey, question for you. Um, obviously, the film's about Mr. Portman in architecture, but we know that there's a whole other side to John's life and career here in Atlanta, which contribute beyond his architecture to elevating the city to national and international significance. And I thought it'd be great if you could talk a little bit about that side of Mr. Portman. Uh, uh, well, first, I wanna build, I wanna build on what uh, Ben said. Uh, John Portman does not like for people to get into his space. He, uh, he's a well-kept secret. He doesn't write anything about himself. He doesn't give lectures about himself. And he's little known outside of a few people who are close to him. But he's been active in the city and he's had a huge impact on the city. Now, one obvious impact is Peachtree Center. But it goes way beyond that. He, when he opened the Mart in 1961, he had the first two uh, racially integrated restaurants in the city, in that building. Um, at that time, we all know what we were going through. He was one of the founders of Action Forum, which is a small group of, uh, it's a black and white business, uh, people who get together, there are no politicians, and they really discussed and how to solve problems. They were all uh, dedicated to not having those kind of problems in Atlanta, and it really set a model for the rest of the, the country. Um, he was one of the founders of uh, uh, Central Atlanta Progress, which has had, which co-sponsored, he was very active, but it's had a huge impact on downtown Atlanta. Uh, I want to go back to Peachtree Summit. When you think about it, most cities that rebuilt did it with public money. He built Peachtree Center with absolutely no public support. He put himself completely at risk 
to develop Peachtree Center. He's dedicated to the city. He didn't want to see it uh, go fallow. And he was determined, you know, people thought he was uh, maybe a little uh, not right with it. <laughs> but he was dedicated to it. Uh, I can go, he, he, was the, he was determined that Atlanta should become an international city. Well, he didn't just think about it and dream about it. He became the Danish consulate. But more important than that, he was one of the founders of the World Trade Club. And he worked very hard at bringing foreign uh, uh, businesses into the city. Uh, he's been very philanthropic for the city. Nobody knows what he did because he doesn't talk about it. Now, the list, I can go on and on, but I think uh, he was born here. He's lived, his office has never been further than about a half a mile from where he was born. And uh, it's still there. He's dedicated to this city. He's a product of this city. He's, a, he's just a plain, proud redneck. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we're going to move on to you, Mac. <laughs> You, you didn't answer his question. <laughs> I know, but I had fun talking about other things. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> so, Mac, I'm putting on your hat as a professor of architecture. What is the legacy of John Portman to a new generation of architects and architecture students? I'm, I'm going to do the same thing Nikki did. First of all, I wanted to congratulate Ben on the film. Uh, from the standpoint of an architect, to capture architecture in film in the dynamic way that you did to, to address those issues that Michael Hayes so eloquently outlined in uh, his few uh, clips about the fluidity of John's uh, architecture in the layering of space, in the layering of the texture uh, that has so much to do with making uh, John's work um, public and accessible. Uh, I thought it was really, really quite beautiful. The only thing I would say is, you know those shots where you've got my face and my hands <laughs> and my voice all in the same shot? Yeah, I know. We're I working think you on need it. to cut at least one of those. We'll, we'll, we'll get that. Out of each, uh, yeah. okay, anyway. Okay. Um, so what was your question again? I think, <laughs> something about, the, the as, a, as a professor of architecture, what is, what is Mr. Portman's legacy to a new generation of architects and students? Well, right at the end of the film, I, I made some statement about how John, uh, in effect, has innovated and challenged not only the profession of architecture, he has done so also with the discipline of architecture throughout his career throughout his career. I should add to that also, he's done so with an architecture that has absolutely piqued the imagination and lifts the spirit of, I guess, what would now be millions of people. Uh, that's a legacy. And I think the legacy, uh, especially for someone, for architects, for architects here, is that you can have a life in architecture that will truly sustain you your, your entire lifetime. It's a, it's a discipline and it's a subject that is as pervasive as John outlines. It is integral, uh, literally, to everything that we do in life is primarily done within architecture. So as an architect, it, it, his, his legacy should be that you can challenge this act of architecture, you can innovate in it, and you can sustain a life that's all around the kind of set of principles that, that permeates through what you do and how, how you live, and the people that you live with and the people that you care most about. That's pretty inspiring stuff. Well, we're going to um, take a few questions from the audience, but I think before we do that, um, Virginia, is this the mic I'm going to use? I do want to acknowledge and perhaps um, 
um, ask for commentary from one more participant in the film. Ambassador Andrew Young has just joined us. <laughs> He's in the back row. Ambassador Young, the podium is yours. Uh, maybe I'll pose the same question as I did to Mickey. What is, what is Mr. Portman's legacy to the city of Atlanta? Well, I wrote him a note the other day and said we ought to carve out the 35 or so squares that he has developed and just name it Portmanville. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know another city or another person uh, that has done as much in a cohesive and comprehensive way to consolidate a downtown anywhere. And um, this was a long shot. And when he started with the Apparel Mart and the Cane Towers, people had given up on the city. Other developers were moving to Dallas. And um, or to the suburbs. And we work together. And I think that's one of the things that uh, he's also good for the politics of the city. Because he has taken people like me who don't know anything about urban development uh, and said we can work together. And we can work together and that I'm interested in profits and buildings and you're interested in jobs. That's the same thing. And all we have to do is work together and we can create America's next great city, which I think he's done. <laughs> let, me, let me just say though, he's had a lot of company in this because uh, I see Charlie here, Loudermilk, I don't know where Herman is, uh, but uh, this is the only city I think in um, America where the business community came together to try to take on the problems of the poor. And one of the reasons, I think, is that maybe all of them started out kind of poor. <laughs> <laughs> and they saw the greatness of America and the freedom and opportunity here, and they were not encouraged, they were not intimidated, and they did prevail with a vision that I think the rest of the world uh, emulates, and they invited him all over the world to try to do the same thing he's done here, and he's doing it all right every way I've seen it. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador Young. So we're ready to take a few questions from the audience. I'll hand this over to Virginia Shear. <laughs> and she's got on her running shoes. Hi, my name is Amber Lawson. I'm a student at Southern Polytech in the construction management program. And I'm always interested in the relationship between the architect and the contractor to kind of bring the buildings to fruition. And uh, they talked about John Portman as the developer and as the architect. How involved was he with the contracting and the building of the building and bringing those wondrous buildings to fruition? Yeah, Mickey. Uh, <laughs> when, you're the, when you're the developer, you're responsible for everything because you're gonna pay all the bills and you're taking all the risks. But he, we never went into the construction business because our risks were great enough already. So we hired uh, contractors and uh, pass the, the risk on to them. But uh, we worked very carefully with them. We ver worked very closely with them. We, uh, we <coughs> tended to uh, repeat work with contractors because every job that you do is a pickup job. You have a new team of everything. So we found it uh, desirable when we could we worked with people like uh, Herman Russell, J. A. Jones Construction Company, but our relationship with them was very clear. 
We had a contract with them. They lived up to their contract, and we paid the bills when they passed them on to us. But we never went into the construction business. I might follow up a little bit on that, that question, if it's okay. Uh, I think if you look at the history of architecture, what you'll find is that uh, the relationship between a contractor, let's say contractor, builder, maker, fabricator, artisan, and the architect itself is crucial to the success of great architecture. And that you'll find that the really great architects through history uh, found a way to develop that special relationship. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, name has been mentioned a lot here tonight, and I think it, it, he's actually a very uh, interesting relationship between John and Frank. I would even come up to date a little bit from Frank and, and mention that other Frank, uh, Frank Gehry. And those, John Portman, Frank Gehry, Frank Lloyd Wright have all found a way to do their work to, to, to make the, the distinctive nature of their work buildable by making relationships either in the business world with contractors, with developers, with politicians, you name it. They've structured their practice, they've structured their belief system that would integrate the people that are out there making and investing and taking risk in their ideas. You had to find contractors who were interested in executing your vision. They were in, in, as in love with it as you are, and not the contractor who's trying to figure out how he can trick you to build something less than you wanted, and there's some out there. But uh, I, I agree with you. You said there. that, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm old enough now, you know, I don't <laughs> worry about it. <laughs> And, and I think it's important to remember that it, that it works. I mean, when Portman did this early on, uh, Mickey said he was almost tossed out of the society. And what I was so impressed with was, um, you know, going across the river from where I am, from Boston to Cambridge, and seeing that that's how they teach it now. And that's how they teach it at other architecture schools, that there's a much more integrated sensibility to answer your question that, that this guy was just a rogue cowboy about. And I, you know, I'm familiar with Georgia Tech, who I think are doing a wonderful job of integrating the education of the two so that they understand what each has to do. And uh, it, I know they're doing that in other universities. I just happen to be uh, close to Georgia Tech. Hi, my name is Neil Pratt. I'm also a student at Southern Poly Architecture, so I look forward to seeing what that relationship will be like. Um, for those of you that work with Portman, I believe Mickey, um, did he work in front of his co-workers? Did you see the des designs coming into place, or did he come out of a dark cave with this master plan? <laughs> <laughs> and was it a, a work in progress? Like, did, did things change? Like, even during construction, no, let's change this. Or was it this? you know, the master plan, like I said. All right. The way John Portman worked, he was the only architect in the office who didn't have a drafting board. And the reason he didn't have, to, didn't have a drafting board, he worked on all, everyone else's drafting board. <laughs> he spent all day, he would start a project with a designer, he would go to his drafting board, he may come in with a sketch on the back of something, could be anything, and say, here's where, I, I, I've studied the problem. The problem's telling me this is the way to solve it. He never started a project with some preconceived notion as to what it should be. He looked for the truth. He looked for uh, the, you know, the, the, let it grow out of the problem. Uh, but he then would, could go from board to board. And he has a unique ability that whatever he's working on the, at that time, nothing else is on his mind, nothing. And he went from board to board, he would spend all day, and guess what, he still does it. And he still works six days a week. 
His people are on the, their boards on Saturdays, uh, but he does it by going from board to board. And the other thing he does that I think is wonderful is as he's thinking, he's talking. He's explaining what he's thinking, why he's doing it. You saw that in the film just a little bit. He was making a few lines on a piece of paper, but he was explaining to them. This is the way he teaches. This is his method of teaching. And the interesting thing is, he not only does it with the designs, he looks at the working drawings, he gets down to the smallest details and he can drive you slap dab crazy <laughs> if you have made a mistake, or done something that's not reflective of the problem you're dealing with. And to me, he has a unique ability that when he looks at a sketch, he's really inside the space. He's almost in a trance. It always made me mad as the Dickens because he had already seen the space and he would say, I'd be working on the other side of it. Behind him, he said, well, you know that's not right. You saw it. Hell, I didn't see it. <laughs> he did. <laughs> and so he never, I don't think he owns a cave. <laughs> uh, he was always out there with everyone. He liked to work directly with everybody. So they understood what he was trying to do. You know, I'll just add it. It's kind of like making a film, to be honest. And it's what made making this film kind of special because suddenly you realize wait, you guys at Portman are doing what we're doing, and we do the same thing. And, you know, John wasn't crazy about us shooting on the floor where some of the stuff's done, because he knows that part of this building is gonna end up over here, and that this development slated for here could end up there. And it's what we do in the cutting room. Uh, so there was, there was a kind of mutual appreciation and a kind of understanding that was made him an easy subject despite being remote a little bit personally, he got the process because the process isn't so different. Uh, unlike our two former audience speakers, uh, I'm not a student, I'm too reti I'm retired, so I'm a student of life now. <laughs> and one of the things that uh, it seems to me about your film and about John Portman was the first thing that he did was that uh, uh, community uh, housing project. Antoine Graves. Yeah, it, that, that, and as he said, it's a shame this has to come down. But uh, the rest, uh, uh, the other things in his life, uh, it sort of reflected from that, uh, uh, the, the, the culture of Atlanta, which uh, he's helped to develop in a more, uh, uh, racially uh, positive way, uh, the, the Chinese, the, the culture there that he was able to go in there, uh, it seems like it's a very, a very human uh, thing to do. And I think for all of you younger people here who are students, remember you have to do something that you'll be proud of when you're older, when your life has moved on, that you can say, I did the world is better for what I for my being here. And I, just a comment that uh, I think may be important to say about John Portman, and uh, your film says it well, by the way. Thank you. Well said. Um, I must tell you, he ruined the whole thing, though, because I went to Antoine Graves, figuring this is my big drama moment. You know, the guy's gonna break down and cry. I was, you know, I, I was very upset that building was coming down, and understand all the reasons it is. And it's true, he does say, on one hand, it's a shame it's gotta come down, but he does it with that little pixie thing in his eye and, and smile and giggle and says, you know, I'm getting out of here, I'm moving on, you know, he's, he's not dwelling in it. Um, you know, it's remarkable to make a film about an architect who outlives one of his early projects. I don't know if that's ever been done. Uh, that an architect lives to see his work I come down. I have t-shirts that are uh, older than some of my, that have lasted longer than some of my buildings. Well, I, especially the ones here in Atlanta. I'll tell you a secret. 
the first building I worked on when I went to work for John Portman was Antoine Graves. I walked in and his uh, uh, head, uh, the guy that, th there were six of us then. That was the size of the firm. But um, they handed me a big old stack of books, which were all the rules for building public housing. And they said, Mr. Portman's gonna expect you to know all of that when you come back in on Monday. <laughs> that was Friday. <laughs> I'd like to say something. Uh, you know, Ben, in watching the film, the, one of the things that uh, really hit me most was right at the very start when John was talking about his trip to Brasilia. He had actually told me that trip a couple of times, but somehow in watching the film, what, what hit me, and this may even sound negative to uh, many of you, but I don't mean it negative at all. What, what was, I think, really profound about that moment to him was that he decided to critique the, the existing sort of wave of architecture in, in, in what might be called sort of high modernist or international style architecture. He decided to critique it, to build a practice, to build, again, his, his sort of approach to architecture against that sort of what might be called norm at the time. Um, I think that's, a, again, for an educator and for a lesson for students in the office, I mean, in this audience and uh, a broader uh, audience of, of students, that that's a, a fantastic lesson about what the creative um, person has to be in society. They have to react against, they have to look, they have to critique, and they have to develop an approach to what they're doing that is based on this kind of um, passion for something to change. And, and I'm sure you're right, Mac, but to a guy like me who doesn't know anything about architecture, some of your words sound very highfalutin mm -hmm. and, and very remote. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So what, what strikes me... As long as he knows it, sorry. <laughs> what strikes me is a different image that Ambassador Young talked about, and I haven't had a chance to apologize to you because I do owe you another film about the history and rise of Atlanta. Um, but Ambassador Young talked about going around the neighborhoods with John and taking pictures. And later in a different instance, Ambassador Young talked about pulling out his own camera and taking pictures of everybody who was building this stuff and mm -hmm. how many thousands of people that was. So I'm sure you're right. And what's so interesting about Portman in a way is you know, part of the power of the film, if it has some, is from who is saying what in the film. And Paul Goldberger is a pretty well-respected architectural critic in this country. He's so, a tough critic. So when he says it, you know, you can pretty damn well believe it. But um, but you cut out all the highfalutin stuff that he said. <laughs> I, I know you did because I, he didn't say highfalutin things. I, I, well, I had, well, it, well, he did. He did not. He did uh, not. He, seriously, right? Uh, yeah, big, but I mean, to me, this idea of this architectural type or genre coming out of driving, ar driving around the city with Andy Young and saying, Christ, they're all in their stoops, you know, they're, you know, minding everybody else's business. And so that's how you got this thing is, that is one of the most emulated forms mm -hmm. in the business, you know, uh, it just... But that's, a, a, again, it's... Uh, what, it, I, what I'm trying to say is that for young architects here and for those that are that observe social conditions and i can say for those that have the opportunity to ride around atlanta with andrew young <laughs> which i think is a pretty highfalutin <laughs> situation <laughs> that i've never enjoyed uh, that out of those kinds of personal observations um, you, you learn to react, to trust those instincts. That's not too highfalutin, is it? I mean, John talks about instincts and intuition in his work. I must say that uh, one of the things that uh, I think uh, a bit of an elephant in the room here is 
Why isn't John Portman's work more discussed in these highfalutin terms, in, in the highfalutin schools, in, in terms that puts him within, embeds him within the discourse of architecture? Same thing happened to Frank Lloyd Wright that, is, mm. that happened to John in this regard, mm. and a lot of other really primarily, I would argue, primarily completely American architects mm. that mm. are not discussed and, and, in, in, in the realm and the discourse but, uh, of architecture. But I think there are understandable, not understandable, but there are reasons. Uh, back when we first started, uh, we weren't, we were in Atlanta, Georgia, we weren't up east. And if you weren't an architect, we could get no one's attention because we weren't part of what was then considered the elite. We were a bunch of southern whatever we were. All we were doing is just plain doing it. And then on top of that, we weren't even pure. My gosh, we were actually uh, controlling our own projects. I mean, you don't do that. And so, and people, if someone took us serious as architects, the answer they would, they would get from academia, from not you, but your predecessors were, oh, you can't take these guys serious because they're developers. Then the dang them developers would say, no, you can't do business with that guy because he's a crazy architect. And so we were fighting an uphill battle. And uh, the, the, an asset that John had was he believed in himself. Just exactly what Emerson said. The one person he believed in was himself. He never tried to do something that would make his peers like it. He never started a project with a preconceived notion. He believed in his own judgment, and he was a risk taker. He believed in it strong enough. This is very unarchitectural, in my opinion. Well, kudos then to the high, among other things, uh, for not being afraid to put on an exhibition. To first of all, to say we have, we have something that's a bit of a gem, an American gem, in our city, and we're not going to be afraid to mount an exhibition about it. Because that, that was really the, the inspiration for the film, in a way, was you look at this, and this is serious stuff on some level, as you say. And all I missed about coming to to visit the exhibition when I did was the guy. And, you know, hopefully that's what the film does, is it, it lets you hear in his words a little bit about how he thinks about it. I, I think the film is wonderful. Per, I mean, personally. Now, <laughs> I think the film as a piece of uh, uh, cinematography, you know, as a, just as a piece of film is great. I've never seen editing like this. There were no narrators up there. You, you had to edit, what, a hundred and, you told me 110 hours worth Well, you of, gotta take a few floors out of a building here and there once in a while, too. Right. So. But what it has done is, and I'm repeating myself, John Portman never let anyone talk about him. There's been a lot written about his work, but nothing about him. He is an enigma to most people, nothing. What this film does is it is a showcase for who he is, and it's a showcase for his philosophy of architecture. And since he will never write, I think it is a step in ensuring that he has a legacy that, that that will be lasting. Well, and those are, those are the choices you make as a filmmaker. I mean, I, I know Andy Young would have, and I would have liked to make a series about John Portman and one talking about his involvement with the city and, and racial politics and, and progress in the city, another about his influence in other parts of the world. Um, I just think it's so nice that, um, first of all, the guy isn't gonna die, so don't get worried about that. But it's nice that he's able to go to Harvard and get the kind of reception that, as you say, Mac, for so long he hasn't. 
uh, and to be honored at places like Venice, and that was the whole point of that little scene, was to just sort of say, outside of Atlanta, even where some people get caught up in local politics and stuff, you know, you can say, oh my God, there's this, you know, there is this gem out there. So um, that was the point. Yeah, hey, Mick. Uh, I'm, I'm Charlie Lattimore. John Portman has been a very close friend of mine, his family, for many years. And I think the important thing about John is he's kept a balance between his family and work and, and the philanthropic thing, city, and so forth. Uh, to me, that's the strongest thing. But I want to give you a little bit of history. At, um, many years ago, they were going to build a mark out on I-85, and a group of Atlantans, I knew them, and uh, Bill Hartsfield and John Portman said no. They thought they were going to build it on 85 because we couldn't put the parking in the city of Atlanta that the law required. And Bill Hartsfield and John Portman says, we will change the law where, where we don't require all that parking John, if you'll build the mark, and John says, I'll build it. So that's how we started back building the city of Atlanta, the center core of Atlanta. Uh, the mark was number one, and then, of course, John with the hotels and so forth. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, thank you, everyone. I think we're going to end the program, and we invite you all to move on to the reception again, which is in center space. So. Ben, Mac, and Mickey, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>